If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. The fact is, you might want to just kind of turn to Acts first, chapter 8 first. Kirk Cameron wasn't raised in a Christian home. He knew nothing about God or Jesus Christ. He had never read his Bible, never prayed, didn't attend church when he was growing up, considered himself an atheist. Cameron was 14 years of age when he first appeared as Mike Seaver on the television series Growing Pains. The series was one of the uh, top-rated shows on television for several years, and Cameron found himself surrounded by fame and adoring fans and riches and wealth beyond his wildest dreams. He had it all as a teenager, or so it seemed. As he sat in a new car that he had just purchased with cash for his 16th birthday, he wondered why he felt so empty when he was living the American dream. And though he had never been taught how, he found himself talking directly to God there in his brand new car. He said, and, and, and I quote, God, if you're there, I want to know you. If you are real, I have completely ignored you my entire life. And if I die and find out that I am wrong about your existence, I've played the part of the biggest fool and all of my money and popularity will not mean anything on that day. So he started attending church, started reading his Bible. And as he grew in his spiritual curiosity, he soon discovered some new convictions that didn't set well with the producers of the show Growing Pains. For example, in one scene, he was asked to wake up in bed one morning next to a young woman, look at her and say, hey babe, tell me again, what is your name? And whenever he found himself in these uncomfortable scenes, Cameron would ask the producers if they could slightly change them. And whenever he did, the producers would spin it the same way, oh, here's Kirk trying to push his religious views onto the show again. Kirk has since starred in the Christian movie series Left Behind, the 2008 movie entitled Fireproof, about a, a fireman who becomes a Christian, realizes how selfish he has been in his life, and then fights to win back his wife's affection. Cameron's not ashamed of his biblical views and has been loudly criticized for stating that homosexuality is not natural, that he believes God created marriage to be enjoyed by one man and one woman. His wife is Chelsea Noble, who just happened to be his co-star on Growing Pains, his girlfriend on the show. They are committed Christian parents with six children, four of them adopted and two of them biological. The former atheist now says, and I quote, I am simply trying to be faithful to the God who saved me, who changed me, and who has commissioned me to tell everyone about the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus has the power to change their hearts also. Indeed, God is changing human hearts on a daily basis. And our Bible text deals with a miraculous conversion that rocked the first century world. When Saul of Tarsus met Jesus Christ, not only was his life drastically changed, but his conversion would forever change the rest of the world as well. Uh, Saul would later become known as Paul and in Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. And, and uh, just to save confusion, I'm going to be referring to him the entire time here through, as, as Paul in our message today. Now, if you're not reading through the Bible, the entire Bible with us this year, I think it's important each week to, to look at the, the Scriptures for the message the next week. Read those, become familiar with those as we prepare for the message. So if you turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, we're not going to take time to read the entire text this morning, but I want you to follow along if you will. We're first introduced to Paul at the end of Acts 7. I want to look here first of all at Paul's previous life. And in Acts chapter 7, we are told that Paul guarded the, the coats of those Jewish religious leaders who were stoning Stephen to death for preaching the truth. Paul completely agreed with killing Stephen. And Acts chapter 8, verse 1 tells us, a great wave of persecution was unleashed against Christians in Jerusalem following Stephen's murder. And Paul, it tells us, was going everywhere to devastate the church. 
Paul went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into jail. Why? Because they had changed from Judaism to Christianity. Christians fled Jerusalem by the thousands, seeking refuge in other parts of Judea and Samaria. And these, new, these Christians shared the good news of Jesus everywhere they went. Whenever they went to another town, they would tell others about Jesus. A little background, Paul was born into a Jewish family in the Grecian city of Tarsus. Consequently, he was both a Roman citizen and he was a Hebrew citizen. Paul was fluent in both the Greek language and the Hebrew language, as well as the Aramaic language that the Old Testament had been written in. He was later tutored in Jerusalem by the famous Old Testament scholar Gamaliel. And if you've been reading along, he was mentioned in Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 38. Paul was extremely grounded in the teachings of the Old Testament. Much of it they had to memorize. He was zealous in his efforts to obey the law. But Paul was also spiritually blinded by Satan to the purpose and the meaning of the Old Testament Scriptures, as were many other Pharisees, Sadducees, and individuals as well. There were many Jewish religious leaders, including Paul, who saw Christianity as a threat to Judaism. They assumed the only way to deal with these new converts, this growing number of Christians, was either to imprison them or to imprison them and kill them. Have you ever noticed the stupid things that people sometimes do in the name of God? It is estimated that that radical and extremist Muslims comprise about 15%. That's just an estimate, but about 15% of the total Muslim population. But those 15% think it is an honor to kill Jews and Americans in the name of Allah. The Ku Klux Klan used to torture and kill people of color in the name of God. And in our text, Paul and other Jews of the first century persecuted and killed those of their own race who chose to worship Jesus Christ and they carried out their persecution in the name of God. A large number of Jews lived in the city of Damascus. Some estimate anywhere from 30 to 40 Jewish synagogues were in that city. And even though it was a six-day journey from Jerusalem to the, the uh, north and the east, in Acts chapter 9, we see it opening with Paul seeking permission from the high priest to go to Damascus and track down any Jewish Christians living in Damascus, arrest them, chain them, bring them back to Jerusalem to stand trial. What I'm trying to show you here is that Paul was the Osama bin Laden of the first century. Paul hated Jesus Christ. He hated all those Jews who, who chose to follow Jesus as passionately as Osama bin Laden hated Jews and Americans. In fact, Paul would later say in his own words, I became very zealous to honor God in everything I did. I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some to death, entering people's houses and arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison. He further said, I used to believe that I ought to do everything I could to oppose the very name of Jesus the Nazarene. I cast my vote against Christ's followers when they were condemned to death. Many times I had them punished in synagogues to get them to curse Jesus. Can you picture that? Can you visualize that? In a house of God, in the synagogue, Paul is beating Christians, bloodying them in the house of God in order to get them to renounce their faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, he did it with a clear conscience, he wrote later to Timothy. And the word picture used in Acts chapter 9 to describe what Paul is, is doing, that word picture in the Greek is that of an animal that is uh, mangling its prey. It would be difficult to over-exaggerate the fact that Paul was a bad dude. 
And even though he knew the Old Testament scriptures well, better than any of us, he was seriously misguided. Knowing the Bible without correctly interpreting it can be dangerous. Even Satan knows the scriptures, and he mildly, slightly twists them sometimes in order to deceive us and, and, and use God's word against us. Now, I doubt this morning if there's anybody here who is as violent as was Paul. But I guarantee you, we've all been as spiritually blind as Paul at times. We all tend to see what we see and, and hear what we hear through our preferred political or denominational or vocational or cultural or gender lenses. We all have a tendency to see what we want to see, to hear what we want to hear, and that may very well be blinding us to the truth, even as it did Paul. So that's what Paul's past life looked like. In verses 3 through 19 of Acts 9, we see Paul's conversion. I think I've used this illustration a few years ago, but Muhammad Ali had to be one of the greatest boxers of all time. He was also, frankly, one of the most arrogant individuals of all time as well. He constantly reminded people, I am the greatest. And he meant it. He wasn't joking. He meant it. Well, while he was still in his prime, one time he was on an airplane and a flight attendant repeatedly told him to fasten his seatbelt because the plane was about to take off. He finally said to her, I am Superman, and Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the flight attendant calmly replied, Superman don't need no airplane either, now buckle up your seatbelt. <laughs> now we laugh, but honestly, we all sometimes think we are Superman. We don't need anybody else helping us. We don't need anybody else telling us what to do. We don't need anyone else's advice. As A.W. Tozer once said, and I quote, before God can use a man, he must first break him. Before we can come to God, we must first realize that we have a need for God. And frankly, it requires a lot from God to break some more than others. A woman was visiting her family in Ireland when she walked into a barn and she saw a young lamb with its leg in a splint. She asked her uncle, who was a shepherd, what had happened. He said, I broke its leg. She said, what? I broke its leg. The little feller had a habit of running off, so yesterday I broke its leg. Why would you do that? He said, every time he took off, he, he was in danger of running off of a cliff or a wolf or a predator, finding him out and, 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 by himself and kill him. And each time I found him, I would bring him back, I'd put him in the flock, only to have him run away again. After I broke his leg, I mended it, I put a splint on it, I talked to him, I carried water to him, I fed him by hand. By the time his leg heals, he will know me. And he will come when I call. And someday this lamb will be the best sheep in the flock, and the flock is going to follow him. You see, in order to break his will, I had to break his leg. Now, brothers and sisters, there are times when God protects us from the consequences of the choices that we make. Praise the Lord when he does. But there is a reason God sometimes allows us to experience the consequences of our disobedient decisions. There is a purpose why sometimes God allows us to wallow in the pig pen that we have created. You see, God must first get our attention before he can get into our minds and into our hearts. And so while Paul is on his way to Damascus to think to do what he thinks is God's work, God personally pays Paul a visit. One moment, Paul is riding high on his horse thinking he's pretty good stuff, and the next moment he's laying on the ground. <laughs> he can't even remember how he got there. He doesn't know what happened. But he hears this voice 
coming from a blinding light. Paul, why are you persecuting me? You see, when we persecute the church, or when anybody persecutes the church of Jesus Christ, they are in reality persecuting the person of Jesus Christ. Who initiated this, this conversation? It wasn't Paul. It was Jesus. Our journey to intimacy with God doesn't begin with you and me. It begins with God. God is the pursuer and we are the pursued. God is the wooer and we are the wooed. God sought intimacy with us by first buying intimacy for us. Sandra Wilson writes in her book entitled Abba's Arms that Christianity is the one religion in which God personally seeks an intimate relationship with human beings and spares no expense in order to make it happen. Rick Warren writes in his book entitled The Purpose Driven Life, and I quote, God made you to love you, and he longs for you to love him back. God says in Scripture, I know every one of you by name. I know how many hairs exist on every person's head. Before a word is ever processed from your brain to your tongue, I already know what you're going to say. Before you were ever formed in your mother's womb, I already knew you. Peter wrote that God is not wanting any of us to perish before finding His love and His forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote that God is kind toward us God is tolerant of us so that we will come to our senses, repent of our stubbornness, and turn to Him. John wrote, the only reason we can even begin to love is because God took the initiative to first love us. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And now God's Son appears to Paul on the road to Damascus and says, Paul, what in the world are you doing? What are you thinking of? Now, it's interesting, and, and, and this conversion of Paul is recorded three times in the book of Acts. Here and two other times when he's, he's giving his defense of what has happened in his life. And as we combine those three uh, accounts together, it's interesting to note that, that Paul's companions who were with him, they heard something, but they, they didn't specifically hear that it was the Lord and, and what the Lord said to Paul. They, they saw a brilliant light, but they didn't specifically see the Lord in the light. Now, on the other hand, Paul was physically blinded by, by what he saw. And yet, the Bible tells us he saw everything and he heard everything. Johnny Erickson Tata repeatedly says, it is better, she said, to be physically handicapped and know Jesus than to be physically whole and not know Jesus. Most of the world is like Paul's companions, those who were traveling with him. The, the people of this world think they know the truth. The people of this world think they are wise and pretty smart. In truth, they hear, but they're not really listening. They see, but they don't really comprehend what they're seeing. Dale Evans, wife of cowboy star Roy Rogers, I think summed it up all, for everyone when she said, and I quote, all my life I searched for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when what I really needed I found at the foot of the cross. Get this, God loves you and I so much. He is willing to let us suffer if necessary to get our attention so that we can ultimately find this fullness of, of a love relationship with Him. And sadly, like Paul, that's often what it takes to get our attention. So Jesus instructs Paul to wait in Damascus where a Christ follower named Ananias will tell him what to do. It's interesting, before we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, I don't know if you, if you recognize this, God sends people into our lives to point us to Jesus. 
after we commit our lives to Jesus Christ, God uses us as an Ananias to point others to Jesus. And folks, there's nothing more satisfying, more gratifying, more rewarding than being used of the Almighty God to plant seeds and water seeds and yes, even help harvest seeds of truth in people's lives that forever change them. It doesn't get any better than that. And then in verses 19 through 23, <clears throat> we see Paul's transformation. Young boy delighted his atheist uncle when the nephew told his uncle that his dog had given birth to atheist puppies. Not knowing what atheist puppies were, the uncle visited the boy one week later and said he wanted to see these atheist puppies. The little boy corrected his uncle and told him they had become Christian puppies. <laughs> the uncle was obviously puzzled and asked, when did the transformation take place? And without hesitation, this little boy, this little nephew answered, when their eyes were opened. How true that is, huh? Our text tells us that after Paul's eyes were opened, in verse 19, he immediately began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, Jesus is indeed the Son of God. And the Bible tells us everyone who heard him was amazed. Isn't this the same man who had persecuted Jesus' followers with such devastation in Jerusalem? Didn't he come here to Damascus to arrest Christians and take them back in chains to Jerusalem for trial? What's happened? What got into this guy? Well, you and I know what happened. He met Jesus Christ. And when Paul met Jesus, his eyes were open to the truth. And when Paul's eyes were open to the truth, the truth dramatically changed the way that Paul lived. And when our eyes are open to the truth, our lives will dramatically change as well. And a good portion of the rest of the book of Acts deals with, with Paul's travels around the world sharing this good news with others. Thirteen letters in the New Testament are penned by the Apostle Paul. He was a new man. His old habits were gone. His old ways of living were gone. His old priorities were gone. The persecutor of Christians was now a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. Those Paul once loathed, he now loved. The man who once loved to hate was now hated by others. The man who once worked for God now walked with God. Paul's conversion may have been dramatic, and Paul's transformation may have been dramatic, but brothers and sisters, it's no more dramatic than my transformation and your transformation. You've got to understand here, the only thing that matters in life, and I can't emphasize that enough, the only thing, can I say it again, the only thing that matters in life is Jesus Christ. Paul had everything. He was a rising star. And yet Paul wrote to the Philippian Christians, I consider everything I once had. I mean everything. Everything I once had in life was no is nothing compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Everything else is like garbage compared to knowing Jesus. Now i got to tell you, I'm living proof that after we come to Jesus, we're still going to sin. I know that. Satan will do anything he can to derail this good work that God has begun in our lives. But our thinking changes as we learn God's truth. And as our, our thinking changes, our lives change as we live God's truth. I met with two different guys, sets of guys this last week, small groups, if you will. And we were talking about how the Holy Spirit has, has worked in our lives. And every one of them, every one of them has said, you know, I have more peace or I've got more joy than I used to have. I've got more self-control. I've, I've got more patience. Every one of us realized that we have grown in the last 15 to 25 years because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, our knowledge of God's Word, our fellowship with other Christ-worshiping people and, and our service for God. 
Tony Campolo is a college professor, a author and speaker. On his first night in Honolulu, Hawaii for a Christian conference, I, I'm wondering what a guy's got to do to get a gig down there. You know what I'm saying? You know anybody needs a Christian speaker in Honolulu? Drop my name if you would. You know? He found himself totally wide awake at 3 a.m. in the, the, the very first night, you know? 3 a.m. because of the six-hour time difference uh, from where he had come from. So he walks into this tiny coffee shop at 3 a.m. and he sits down and as he's eating his donut and sipping his coffee at 3.30 in the morning, nine rather boisterous prostitutes walk into the coffee shop. Now it's a small place and so they sit down on either side of Tony Campolo. One lady casually remarked that tomorrow would be her 39th birthday. Another sarcastically said, well, what do you want, a birthday party? The first lady said, why do you have to be so mean? I was just saying it was my birthday. I've never had a birthday party in my entire life. Why would I think I would get one now? After the ladies of the night left, Tony Campolo asked the waiter if they came in every night. Waiter said they did. And an idea came to Campolo from the Holy Spirit. He said, what do you think if we had a birthday party for, for that lady tomorrow morning? Waiter thought it was a great idea. Volunteered to bring a birthday cake. 2.30 a.m. the next morning, to Tony Campolo was back at the diner decorating it with crepe paper. Put this, this uh, big sign up that said, Happy Birthday, Agnes. By 3.15 a.m. in the morning, the diner had filled with prostitutes. And when Agnes came in, they all jumped up and sang, Happy Birthday. Campolo writes, and I quote, I've never seen a person so stunned and so shaken. Her mouth fell open. Her knees buckled and she started to cry. When the birthday cake was brought out with all the candles, she totally lost it and started sobbing. When Harry the waiter, a gruff guy, a heavy guy, told Agnes to blow out the candles, she hung her head and she asked, Harry, is it all right with you? I mean, if we don't, what I want to ask, Harry, is would you mind if we didn't eat the cake right away? Would you be mad if I just kept the cake for a little while? With that, Agnes picked up the cake carried it out of the diner like she was carrying the Ten Commandments. And as she walked out of the diner and the door shut behind her, there was a stunned silence. Nobody knew what to say. Tony Campolo broke the silence by asking, what do you say we pray together? At 3.30 a.m. in the morning, Tony Campolo led a diner full of prostitutes in prayer for Agnes. He prayed that God would be good to her. He prayed that God would help her to find salvation. He prayed that, that God would help her life to change. And when he was done, Harry, the waiter, said with anger in his voice, Hey, you never told me you were a preacher. What kind of a preacher are you anyway? What kind of a church do you belong to? Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Tony Campolo quietly said, I belong to a church that throws a birthday party for a prostitute at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. Harry thought for a moment and then he said, there isn't a church like that. If there was, I'd join it. They said in the first century that Jesus Christ was out of his mind. But the Jesus I know would throw a birthday party for a prostitute destitute for love at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. May we be that kind of church. May we be that kind of people. Jesus Christ is too good to keep to ourselves. Jesus is the only way to life. 
He's the only source of truth. And I'm here to tell you this morning, it doesn't matter how vile or immoral we have been in the past. It doesn't matter how far we've wandered from God in the past. It doesn't even matter what kind of sin we may currently be living in. Because the Jesus I know loves you. And He loves me. The Jesus I know can change your life and can change my life as dramatically as He changed Paul's life. What do you say we be a congregation of Paul's, a congregation of Kirk Cameron's who can't wait to show and tell others about Jesus Christ?